Thank you for the nice word. Uh, thank you for inviting me. I'm very honored to uh, to be associated to the name of Tony Atkinson and, and Tony Atkinson work. Uh, you know, you mentioned my my book, my 2001 MIT book on uh, entitled "The Economics of Risk and Time." I should have written it uh, with the title "The Economics of Risk and Time and Inequalities," uh, because in fact uh, the the standard framework of uh, utilitarianism is linear with respect to. Uh, to uh, to um, you know uh, people uh, you put you add the utility of Mr X with the utility of Ms., uh, Mr Y uh, it's uh, linear with respect to uh, to time you combine the utility today with utility tomorrow and you combine uh, utility to state of the world that is you have this inequality time and 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 risk in the same framework of the uh, of utilitarianism and in fact the result you, I, you can get in in uh, in the uh, in risk domain you can reproduce it in uh, in the uh, in the inequality domain the best the best example is uh, this uh, two papers published in uh, in the same year of jet journal of economic theory the tony atkinson paper on me measurement of inequality uh, and the same year, uh, production of a paper by uh, Rothschild and Stiglitz on how do, you, do we measure, in fact, are the two uh, dual, uh, uh, du dual issues of the same problem. Okay, so today I will use you know, uh, that, that the, the kind of idea that has been developed in this literature to think about the problem associated to, uh, to think that are quite hot topic these days in our, in our, uh, in our society, I mean, um, how do, how much do we take care of uh, of the future? How do we take care of uh, future generation? How do we take care of uh, the notion of sustainability? And when you think of uh, of extension rebellion or growth movement that uh, playing more and bigger and bigger influence uh, in our Western society, I mean, uh, there is this idea that economists. Yeah, I'm not very good in tackling this issue. So, um, markets are too long term, too short termist, and we don't we don't take take care enough of uh, the the impact the, the impact of our way of living and way of production for people who will live on this planet in the distant future. And there is a lot of frustration and a lot of social stress these days for that. And France are particularly clear. Uh, every year at the end of the, of the academic year, students enter to the room and say, what did you do with our teaching program? Didn't learn the big things of sustainability and, 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 uh, and long-term issue. So, um, so I, I, I will try to develop uh, ideas associated to the fact that I think, in fact, the basic ingredients we use in economics uh, over, the, over the years, in fact, basically over more than two, two, one or two centuries now, utilitarianism. It seems that utilitarianism focuses too much on the present. Okay, Utilitarianism is possible with short-termism, not, not long-termism. I will try to explain that when when you int we introduce the deep insert is into the model into this utilitarianist framework. In fact, probably it's likely that we have to revise many of the things that we have learned in school about you know discount rates, uh, asset prices, uh, in particular the social cost of carbon, which is a special uh, uh, as asset price. So yes, so, so my presentation will focus on the discount rate, which is in fact the translation, the, the, the technical or the operational translation of the degree of short or long termism in society. How much do we penalize the impacts of our actions in terms of infrastructure, uh, climate change, uh, biodiversity? How how do we translate this notion of long termism is into practical guidelines for decision, public decision, individual decision? This is to de or uh, de discount rate or a discounting a discounting system. So I will develop uh, um, a discounting system which is compatible with the common good okay what why should we by your should we 
an investment because it will generate benefits only in the distant future. Okay, the answer to that question is the discount rate. It's a, it, it's a really very operational way of, of working. And it's, I mean, I have been involved in other economists in the and uh, most in, uh, mostly in the Western world and in uh, many in this in, international institutions. We have been working to help those institutions to determine their discount rate by how much we do when we perform policy evaluation impacting the future by how much we should penalize the future because it's a future. Okay, so that's that's a really operational question. And today, in the US, for example, for a long time, the United States had one single rate, discount rate, which was 7%. And this week, in fact, last, this last day of a consultation by the White House for reducing this 7% discount rate to a much smaller discount rate of 1.7%. Okay. So sorry, it's too late for you to contribute to the debate. I have been working on the paper on this colleague in particular from the UK. Uh, so, um, yeah, I will try to explain why 7% is too large, whether 1.7% is a good idea or that kind of thing. So <laughs> this yield the question of why do we discount the future? Why, why do we consider that one kilogram of rice delivered in one century from now is value less than one kilogram of rice today. Okay, so that's the question. Okay, because the cornerstone in economics of the discounting system, discounting system is inequality aversion. Why? Well, because in the growing economy, future generation will be wealthier than us. So we face an intergenerational inequality problem. Okay, we are the poor, future generation are the wealthy guys, and therefore investing for the future increase intergener intergenerational inequalities, we should dislike that. And in fact, the discount rate should, could be perceived as the minimum internal rate of return of that compensate for the fact that doing that investment at this adverse effect on intergenerational welfare to increase inequalities. Okay, so you see the link in some work. This is in, we are, to, when we, when we talk about discounting, when we talk about using investment because there are genetic benefits in the distant future, we are doing, talking about the inequalities, in fact, intergenerational. And we are talking. Of course. This is future generation all that us. And so my point here, and that's I mean important fraction of my presentation, how should we take care of the fact that the future is uncertain? To sure that this simple idea we should compensate, uh, we should take into account that the benefits of our sacrifices will go to people who are not so sure. How do we take care, how do we take care of that? It will be, I will not go in more, in more details at this stage. And I will apply this, uh, I will apply this, uh, this question, this, this discounting problem to the specific issues of determining what should be the level of support today for you to reduce emissions of CO2, to reduce the damages uh, that way to do that is to put a price on carbon. Okay. And the price of carbon should be equal to the present value of the flow of net matches that will be faced by future generation if I emit that CO2 today. Okay. In the Picovian approach, I should to face those marginal damages by asking them to pay for that. Okay. So, so let me illustrate that with, with uh, what is happening these days in the US. 
So, and, and then I will illustrate that also for the UK. So wait for a few minutes for, for getting what you, what happened in, in this country. So in the US, the, the EPA, the US Environmental Protection Agency in November, 2022, delivered this new table. So this is not yet official social cost of carbon for the US, but it's a proposal by this very powerful EPA in the US to uh, uh, regulate uh, environmental issue. And so you see here that uh, uh, the ta this table provided by EPA, this, this document, different social cost of carbon for different time horizon using different discount rate. Okay. 2.5 to 1.5%. Of course, when you use a larger discount rate, you penalize more the future, and therefore the social cost of carbon, the present value of, your, of the benefits of your iPhone today will be small. Did you see clear here? Here we see that on this table. Okay. Uh, there is also an evolution of the carbon price over time. I will not be examining that today. The important point is you see that the US is moving to propose a social cost of carbon at $190 per ton of CO2. This is much bigger this is much bigger than what you used to have in the US. So here is a little history of uh, the evolution of the social cost of carbon or in the US over the last 20 years. Or 15 years. Initially, the, uh, in, in, uh, in the year between 2013 and 2017, because the, the social cost of the carbon price, I would say, was $52 per ton of CO2, they used a relatively large discount rate of 3% per year to get this number. Okay, and then Trump came. He decided that the discount rate should not be three percent; it should be seven percent. He did also the same that led to a carbon price of one dollar per ton of CO two. Then Biden arrived. He said, "No, no, no, no. Let us go back to the three percent. Should be fifty-two percent." And I asked a new commission to go to re-examine the issue. And one of this uh, one of these moves was to this proposal by the EPA. No proposing 190 euro, 190 euros a dollar per ton of CO2 using a discount rate of 2%. So you see here the influence of the discount rate, you have also seen on the previous table, on the level of the social cost of carbon. Okay, and you see this big increase in the social cost of carbon, at least proposed by the EPA in the US. Uh, Okay. Uh, just to mention, yeah, this uh, is linked, this prediction, this use of two person rather than the three person proposed by uh, the Obama administration is linked to this also, the, the fact that the economists are now pushing in the US, and I've been pushing for that for 20 years, for this reduction of the, of the discount. Okay. okay, what about the UK? Well, the UK is that so there is a office, uh, this uh, Department of Business, Energy, and Industrial Strategy uh, that every year revise uh, the carbon value for the UK. Uh, a quick, a quick story about that. There's long been very, very low number, um, mostly because the previous methodology of to estimate the carbon value was just to predict what would be the carbon price on the EU ETF, which has been for a long time very low. Two years ago, I don't know what happened there, but the UK, this administration decided to change the methodology. And they decided to estimate the carbon value as the shadow price associated to this politically determined goal of the two degrees Celsius or 1.5 degrees Celsius, I'm not completely sure about that. So when you impose a, a, a target, a, a goal in terms of temperature, you get, in fact, a, a carbon budget for the UK. And this carbon budget, you can translate it into a shadow price of the constraint that gives you this shadow price. So this is a price 
which is not uh, which is not really related to a discounting system. Uh, it's uh, so I will not spend much time on that. In fact, I have pre I prepared five slides at the end of this presentation uh, talking about that, but I will probably have no time to talk about. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so that's from the introduction. So you see there is a link between discounting and the social cost of carbon. The social cost of carbon is the discounted value of the flow of marginal damage generated by emitting alternatives to today. So the larger the discount rate, the smaller the social cost of carbon. And one of the big issues about this carbon valuation problem has been about which this country should be used to make this estimation. And you see the sensitivity of this, the answer to the question of the discount rate. Okay, so I will let me start with this discount rate. Okay, how do we determine whether an action that will have an immediate cost and future benefit, whether this action is socially deliverable or not? Well, uh, I'm not a philosopher, but I know utilitarianism, and utilitarianism that was being used in economics for a long time is based on two very simple principles. Okay, uh, two principles that are, I feel, very, uh, very ethically appealing. The first one is the view of ignorance that transforms inequalities into risk, but also transforms growth, economic growth, into risk, because if you don't know to which in generation you will belong, growth of the economy imply risk for you under the middle of ignorance. Okay, and therefore inequality aversion and risk aversion will be the same thing. Okay, so so I assume we agree that the view of the principle of the view of ignorance to make decisions with uh, this uh, intersemity principle is a good idea. I also I'm also happy uh, to support the, in, the, the independence action if, if you prefer impact X to impact Y with certainty, you will also prefer impact X with probability P than uh, impact Y with probability P. I think it's very difficult to consider these actions as something undesirable from a normative point of view. I agree that some people, and the other part, that some people uh, fail to uh, behave in that way, but uh, normatively, I think it's a good idea. So the combination of these two simple principles combined with other simple axioms of continuity and things like that generate the expected, the discounted expected utility model to measure to as a determinant of the how to measure common welfare, social welfare, here intergenerational welfare. So if on this planet you have a sequence of generation, we live there, you will live, live here, each generation T consuming CT. I know that uh, I can represent welfare, welfare by this utility function, treating it from K, so that the social welfare is just, just the discounted sum of the flow of expected utility of the different generation. Okay, delta is uh, a rate of pure preference for the current generation. Okay, and the concavity of U represents at the same time risk aversion, inequality aversion, and uh, aversion to smoothing to to uh, consumption fluctuation over time. Okay, um, and so. On top of those two assumptions, I will also take a special case of UTT function with constant relative risk aversion, constant inequality aversion. Gamma, gamma is the measure of the degree of concavity of the UTT function that measure those aversions. Okay, so now this is the technical slide. I'm sorry about that. I would like to convince you that there is an equivalence between the statement, this investment increases social welfare, intergenerational welfare, and statement two, this investment has a positive net present value. Okay, so that justifies the standard approach in the economics and finance 
to use a discount rate to measure present value, net present value, and determining whether it's socially desirable to invest or not in that project, if you don't need, this net present value is positive. Okay, but, so I, I know many people who are not economists say, oh, no, this is finance, uh, present value, you're distancing that price, that's a, that asset price, we, we don't like uh, financial market. No. In fact, this methodology, okay, who probably used by different investors on financial market, it's also something related to normative, a normative way to evaluate the impact of an action, like an investment, on intergenerational welfare. Okay, the point is the following. So consider a simple claim, but so super, consider an action that generates uh, some specific benefit, BT materializing in T years from now. Okay, how do we, how do we, what would be, from the point of view of today, what would be the value of that action that generates this benefit, BT in T years from now? Okay, what's the what's our willingness? What's the value? What's our willingness to pay today to make sure that we will get these benefits in two years from now? What's the present value no, of this future BT? Okay, in order to estimate this value, I just do the standard approach of the willingness to pay. I make sure that if I pay PV today, in exchange from getting for getting BT in two years from now. I will get the same level of social welfare than if I do nothing. I just get the status quo in the, the business as usual flow of uh, consumption per capita. Okay, so PV is the maximum uh, uh, sacrifice in terms of current consumption that you are ready to pay in order to increase your future consumption by 18 years. And BT, I should have said from that from the beginning, BT can be random, can be certain, you decide that uh, at this stage, it's a, uh, uh, you can get it. So as a standard, I do the marginal X approach and assume that BT is small. And in that case, you can make the approximation, the first order approximation of this and that, eliminate the coefficient of both sides of the equality so that you get this approximation that PV is equal to one, this, Coefficient multiplied by the expected benefit expectations from the zero of this future benefit. And this term, you can therefore interpret it as a discount factor. Okay? Present value is the discount factor times the benefit. Okay, so let me denote all T for the discount rate associated to that discount factor. Oh, yes. Let me also make this assumption that PT is statistically linked to CT who a constant income elasticity. Okay, so that the log of BT is linear in log of CT, the coefficient is beta. Why do I do that? But first, because standard is finance, uh, and because, second, because the concept of income elasticity is something natural in economics, and eventually because, and that's the most important, because the sign of the beta tell me something very important about the quality of the benefit. It tells me whether the benefit materialize, is more likely to materialize in good state of nature or bad state of nature. If beta is negative, okay, if beta is negative, it means that BT is larger than when CT is smaller. Okay? Therefore, investing in that project generates some kind of insurance or edging benefits for the future generation. Okay? And that should be valued. And we will see that, of course, in the, in the result. Okay? So, so beta, T, beta is the income necessity of the benefit. Okay? That's it. Okay, and therefore, using the specification format for the ATT function, the CLA specification, using the specification of the linear uh, income, uh, you know, the, the constant income elasticity of the benefit, I get this the definition of the discount rate for T to be used to discount the future expected benefit. If I use this 
specification the discount yeah? to discount the flow of future expected benefits of my project. And I check that this expected net present value using that discount rate is positive. This necessarily means that investing in the project increases intergeneration, intergenerational welfare. Is socially visible. Okay. Of course, everything relies then on which discount rate I should use, and that's the point. Okay. There has been different calibration of the equation that will generate different estimation for rho. Okay. So what you see, you give me the beta, you give me the gamma. The beta is specific to the project. The gamma is a collective preference degree of inequality inversion. You give me the distribution of the future prosperity you expect for the people living in two years from now on this planet. And I should be able to estimate those two expectations. And therefore, I should be able to determine what this country should be used to make sure that this cost-benefit analysis based on this, this country is compatible with intergenerational Welfare. Okay. Any question? Not about the second term. Where is the what's the underpinning for the delta? Oh yes, I forgot to so 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 the delta the delta is also a, pref, a collective preference parameter who, who tell you by how much you dislike future generation compared to your generation. Okay. So it's a uh, facile against future generation. You, you dislike people, you, you penalize people because they are born after you. Okay. Including uh, your children, for example. In, in, including in, your children. Thank you. And in fact, in my calibration, I use delta equal zero. Which people see? I use delta equal zero here. Yeah. 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 One, one, uh, we, are, we were talking at lunchtime about why, why economists use this crazy, crazy idea to, to be racist against uh, future generation, like this imposing a positive delta. I mean, my interpretation is that in, when, we start, when, when Samuel Sun and others in the 30s decided to work on those theory, uh, they, they assume an infinite. Uh, an infinite uh, planet who, who, who will exist forever, where people will live in plus infinity. And therefore, they have the difficulty without this, this exponential decrease in this factor, they have problem with uh, the conversion of this. this By the way, this is crazy. I mean, uh, we all know that the sun will one day disappear from the sky. And this, the life on this planet will disappear. So, so this I, this problem of convergence makes sense. But anyway, that's I don't see why why economists have been using this thing in the past. Okay, so good point. Okay, so now I will I will just for the for the next fifteen or twenty minutes I will calibrate this. Okay, the first calibration which is still today the cornerstone of most of the debate about discounting. Look at the stand, the stand review uh, debates. Uh, is the Ramsey rule. Okay, the Ramsey rule is the translation into mathematical terms of this Atkinson idea. That is, the growing economy, Investing for the future increases the generation of inequality. You are sacrificed from the poor, the generation, to generate more income consumption in the wealthy future generation. That could be socially desirable if this investment has a return large enough to compensate for this adverse effect on social welfare that increases intergenerational inequality. Okay? By how much? By all large, should this internal rate of return to allow you to recognize that this project is beneficial? Well, in the case where you are sure about future growth, let me start with the crazy assumption 
that grows, the, the economy will grow at the constant rate G forever, so CT is equal to C0 times the expansion of G times T, equation, equation one is trivial to, uh, to solve, and it immediately gets you this. The discount rate to be used is flat, it's constant, it's equal to delta, this crazy coefficient, plus gamma times G, and you see, indeed, these two ingredients you need to justify this country. You need, at the same time, a positive inequality aversion, positive gamma. In Atkinson literature, it's, 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 it's denoted epsilon. I'm sorry, it's a very different notation. Uh, and G is the growth rate of the economy. So in a growing economy, G is positive. People dislike investment for the future because it increases their generation and inequality. However, if the internal rate of return of the project is larger than this number, this investment project generates enough additional aggregate wealth in the economy over time that compensates for the fact that the, that economy will face more inequalities in that generation. Okay, so that's that's the idea behind the Ramsey rule. I like I like this version of the Ramsey rule. That do not rely on any mathematical details. Let me let me explain the Ramsey rule without any math. Okay. Uh, forget about high generation. Think of just inequality. Suppose that we have two persons in, in this room. Mr. X consumes twice as much as Mr. Y. Then the standard experiments to determine what should be the, the degree of inequality aversion, the options bucket experiment that I'm going to reverse uh, in a second. And, and this reversion is, the, is coming from the final question. How much are you ready to sacrifice from the poor Mr. Y to get one additional unit of consumption to the wealthy Mr. X? Uh, so you see, you increase inequality through this system. You ask the poor to sacrifice something to get one to the wealthy. If you tell me I'm ready to sacrifice one from the poor to get one to the wealthy, you are inequality neutral. <coughs> but I believe that most of us, we are, also, we are all inequality averse or not, we are not ready to accept a policy uh, that would sacrifice one from the poor to give one to the wealthy. You, uh, so what's the maximum amount you are ready to ask as a sacrifice from the poor to get one to the wealthy? Well, that's not a clear question. Next. Usually the problem is the, 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 the leaky bucket experiment is presented in the opposite direction where you feel better. You, you ask the, the sacrifice from the, from the to get so, something to the poor. He had put you in a very uncomfortable situation to make the opposite of the sign, and I find it more appealing in terms of trying to measure your degree of inequality aversion. So let me assume that we agree collectively to give up as much as 0 to 5, one, one fourth of a unit of consumption to give one to the wealthy. So that's so the, the value. Yeah, right. Okay. Suppose we agree on that. I'm sorry, I have no time to perform an experiment, experiment in this room or a survey. Let me assume this is what I get. Right. So keep that in mind. Now, suppose that we live in an economy where we expect, we are sure that every 35 years, consumption, the GDP double. Every 35 years, you double the consumption capital. Okay, so now let me ask you the following question. How would you, how much would you be ready to sacrifice from the current generation to give one to the generation who will live in 35 years from now? Well, this is exactly the same question, except that rather than asking Mr. X versus Mr. X, why I'm asking for two different generations. But in terms of attitude toward inequality, it is exactly the same question. So you shouldn't swear, you wish I think you should agree the fact that 
we should give up as much as 0 0.25 from the current generation to give one to the generation living 35 years from now. So the, let me re rephrase that in saying the present value of one in 35 years from now is 0 0.25. Okay. Well, this is the Ramsey rule because this answer 0 0.25 to, from the poor to give one to the wealthy is equivalent to Atkinson uh, degree of inequality version of two. This doubling of consumption every 35 years is equivalent to, to annual growth rate of two percent year per year. And this 0 0.25 being the present value of one in 35 years from now is equivalent to a discount rate of four person. And indeed, four person is two times two person. So you see, I don't, in this very simple slide, I'm quite proud of that. I don't need anything about utilitarianism or I'm just based on an experiment asking you about your own degree of inequality aversion. And I conclude something which is equivalent to the answer. I did that this week. <laughs> okay, so now the debate on the stern review. Uh, before stern, we had Nordos. Nordos used typically a ramp, didn't use a ramp. Nordos and stern use a, a social welfare function, uh, and they do not talk about the discount rate. Uh, uh, but, but specifically, when you calibrate the Ramsey rule using the parameters used by Norlos, in fact, he used a rate of pure person for the present of 1.5 person. He used a degree of inequality aversion of 1.45. He used, he assumed a growth rate of, a growth rate of consumption of 2.15 person. And therefore, it gives you, using the Ramsey rule, this kind of rate of mostly almost 5%, and that generated the traditional answer from Nardos in the 2010 of social cost of carbon around $20 per ton of CO2. Stern, Stern report, 2007 or 2006, I'm not sure anymore, and there, there was the publication of the report, and, there, and after that publication of the book. Uh, so Stern used in the case of three parameters, all each parameter is smaller. 0 0.1 rather than 1.5 for delta, 1 rather than 1.45 for gamma, and 1.3 rather than 2.15 for the ground rate. And they imply that you get a much smaller discount rate using the Ramsey rule, and therefore a much larger discount rate. A uh, much larger social cost of carbon. Okay. Uh, so let, let me go to what, what other people think about those parameters. And let me focus in particular on the degree of inequality version. I talked to Rick uh, this week. I also talked to François Bourguignon, who knows very well uh, uh, Tony Atkinson. I asked, I asked them, you know, you know, all those publications by Tony, I, it's hard for me to see what Tony recommended for the degree of inequality version. In fact, my understanding is that don't, don't make a choice. And that's all. It's something I'm surprised. Uh, there, there is no attributable degree of inequality intervention. It's, it's a normative parameter. It's an ethical, it's a philosophical parameter. And I'm surprised not to see any convergence of discussion of what collectively. It's uh, probably not the job of the economist, by the way. Uh, I will come back in a week about that. Uh, uh, that but I'm surprised not to see any convergence on what degree of inequality aversion we should consider when we think about policies to reduce inequality or policies uh, related to, to this kind of thing and, and, and investment. But uh, so I found, thanks to the assistance of uh, Rick Van der Kloek and, and Francois Bourguignon, I, I saw. Uh, relatively recent paper by, by Tony with Randoli in 2010, where they do estimation of the Atkinson equivalent uh, income uh, using gamma, two gamma, two degree of inequality version, 0.125 and two, 
if she would be about both the uh, proposal for which the degree of inequality inversion we should use. Uh, other other uh, experts in the field have been using those numbers for gamma. You see, uh, there, I, would I say that there is a consensus, probably not, but the gamma equal two seems to be quite uh, at the middle of the of the window. Uh, so I will use gamma equal two, by the way. But why why will I do why do I use gamma equal two? Well, remember, I do not come from uh, inequality economics. I come from decision theory under uncertainty. And point one. Point two, remember, under the bit of ignorance, inequality aversion, which is a digital parameter, is, a, is equal to risk aversion, which is a behavioral parameter. Okay. I can estimate your degree of risk aversion. Because of under the video of ignorance, inequality, intergenerational inequalities is risk. Well, I think we should use information from our own degree of risk aversion to determine what the what collective degree of inequality aversion we should use in that kind of exercise. I know this is controversial, but I, I, I strongly feel it's a good idea. So, and, and from, my, from Jacques Drez, my PhD supervisor, a long time ago, uh, and also my own research on the domain in the degree of establishment of gamma equal to is uh, represent uh, represent uh, when you look at insurance behavior, uh, prevention be, uh, investment, uh, gamma equal to is not too bad. I know if you go to finance, you get credit gamma. I don't know too much. Okay, so I take gamma equal to for the reason I just mentioned. For the, from the discussion we should have, I take gamma and take delta equal zero. And then my own estimation of the Ramsey rule, so delta, I use delta equal zero, gamma equal two, what about G? Well, you know what? I think selecting a G to estimate the discount rate I should use today to discount something that will materialize in 200 years from now. And we asking me what's the growth rate of that's the growth rate of consumption capital for the next two centuries is the same question. Of course, it's a random variable. Of course, I don't know G. And, and, and I found the debate between CERN and Nando's quite crazy 15, 20, I mean, 15 years ago. Because using the Ramsey rule, which assumed that there is no uncertainty, whereas we faced a world where there is so much uncertainty about, you know, secular stagnation, uh, uh, technological progress, the end of the, the end of history, because you dis we discovered everything in science and technology, and so we go back to a standard world before the, the industrial revolution. Oh, blah blah blah. It, it, it's also, of course, the, the Ramsey rule makes sense only in the history world, but we live in the history world, and in particular when we think about sustainability, when we think about long term. It's crazy to it's crazy to think of measuring our responsibility to our future generation by assuming that G is law. Of course, if we assume G, equal, if we assume I don't remember if we assume a, a growth rate of two point fifteen percent for the next two centuries, of course we do not have to care to take care of climate change because people future generation will be so much wealthier than us, and you know. Forget about asking sacrifice for the current generation. They will take care of the problem given their wealth. Okay, so conclusion. My conclusion of this is that don't use the Ramsey rule. The Ramsey rule is useful for a world that does not exist. Okay, we live in a society with deep with uncertainty, with deep uncertainty about future prosperity on human beings on this planet, and we need we need to take care about that. Uh, yeah, no, I, sorry, I, I go in the, right, in the wrong direction. Okay, I'm here. Okay. okay, so in economics and finance, we, for a long time, we adapted the hubs to the more risky world. Okay. We call that the asset price literature. <laughs> and in that literature, the standard assumption to represent is to represent risk. Risk about growth, 
least about the evolution of the prosperity of this planet is to make it, is, is, we, we, we describe it by a geometry for the motion. Yeah. And by the way, it's, it's not only intuitive, but also it, it's implied very simple generalization of the answer. So when you make this assumption, you, you get what we call the consumption-based capital asset pricing model. Uh, Robert Lucas uh, and, 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 and others uh, in, the late, uh, in the late 70s provide this outcome. So if you assume that CT follow a geometric Brownian motion with the trend of growth of mu and a volatility of growth of sigma, you need to adapt the Ramsey rule in the following way. What you get is a discount rate that is specific to the project. Okay. Remember, the beta is the income necessity of the, of the net benefit uh, of the project. Okay, different, different projects, different investments, different policies will have different beta. In particular, some policies will have negative beta, uh, will, will, will provide some kind of insurance for the future, whereas others will have positive beta and will increase the macro increase if we invest in them. So the discount rate to be used to a project whose income elasticity is beta is equal to is linear in beta. Or the discount rate for that project is equal to RF. I will mention that guy. I will term this the risk free rate. The discount rate when beta equals zero. Plus beta times pi. Pi is the aggregate estimator. And so when beta equals zero, you have a risk free project. Okay, and for this history project, the discount rate you should use is RF, and the RF is given by that. And this is the Ramsey rule minus something. And this something comes from the risk, the macroeconomic risk future generation phase. Okay, so you see good, good news for utilitarianism, taking into account of risk, imply a reduction of the discount rate. At least the discount rate can use for his free project. And so that's go, that goes into the right direction of sustainability in long term. And that makes sense. Okay? Think by introspection. When yourself you face more risk on your future income, what do you do? Well, you save more. That's the predatory saving motive of things. Okay? So, what is, so say, what is desirable at the individual level is also desirable at the collective level. How do we induce the collectivity to do more for the future when the future is more uncertain? We reduce the discount rate. If you reduce the discount rate, more risky projects will pass the test of a collective level. Okay? And that's exactly what you get here. The risk free rate is reduced by the fact that um, the future is uncertain. Okay, so that's uh, we call this the extended transfer rule because this precautionary term reduces the risk. But you, we also need to take on, into account in this risky world that some project provide some insurance to a future generation, where, whether other increase the risk borne by future generation. And of course, because we are risk averse, we should penalize those projects that increase the micro increase, and we, we should provide a bonus. Or project that provide a hedge or an insight for the future generation. So, a uh, hedge is uh, uh, a project to provide insurance when beta is negative. And indeed, you see that when beta is negative, the discount rate will be reduced because pi is positive. Because of risk aversion. Remember, here the gamma is not inequality aversion, it's risk aversion. But remember, the two are the same. You know, the uh, Okay, so when beta is negative, you get the second reason to reduce the discount rate. Okay, on top of the precautionary effect, you have this risk aversion effect. You, this project provides an insert to reduce the risk more than to generate. And one of the big issues, I will mean, complete a little bit with this afternoon, a little bit because there is no much paper on this issue, there is one by uh, but we don't really know. And I will come that, back to that in one of my two last slides. Uh, we are not so sure that investing in reducing 
in project that reduces emissions of CO2 the heat condition. Uh, and, and the, the profile of benefits with negative. But suppose it's the case that would provide an argument, an additional argument for why we should use a smaller discount rate for those long-term projects uh, in energy transition, and therefore valuing more uh, those investments and doing more immediately. Okay, so what, what are my take from that when you see in this equation the two extensions from the Ramsey rule? So on top of this very simple idea of why we should discount the future because of inequality aversion and in and, and, uh, and, uh, uh, intergenerational and inequality in the growing economy, there are two additional effects. One is precautionary effect and the second is the aging effect. Uh, so uh, you understand that. The problem is, the problem is, when you look at those two formulas and you calibrate the gamma equal to and the sigma equal the volatility of the growth rate of GDP in the UK over the last century, you get something like three percent. Okay, so three percent square times zero point two times two square that is less than one. That, that less than zero point one percent. So the fact that you face in the UK economy face uncertainty about about growth coming from the geometric Brownian motion reduces only very marginally. It goes into the right direction, but it does it very marginally. It's zero, this term is only 0.1 person compared to this fancy term. If you put gamma equal to, and if you believe that growth, the trend of growth is 2 person, you get 4 person here. So four person here, zero point one person. So you get three point nine person. So as a as a decision theorist, uh, I'm frustrated because I spend my life, uh, you know, risk is important. It plays an important role in what we should do in the future. You get this number, boom, your uh, your morale goes down. And here, here too, right? gamma times sigma squared is basically the same thing as this number when gamma equal two. Exactly. So we have a problem. I have a problem, and probably we also have a problem because we are back to 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 square zero. I mean, uh, if I use four percent on the discount rate, my social cost of carbon will be small, and I will be a short termist. Uh, yeah. So let me let me think a little bit deeper about that. You know, for example, for example. Let us calibrate this. Let, let, let me calibrate those formulas for the next three centuries, or six, for the next six centuries. Dice, dice is calibrated for the next six centuries. Six centuries. What new, what trend of growth will you use to calibrate the growth of the UK economy until the end of this millennium? Uh, I don't know how to do that. Uh, so there is this is ambiguous. We should take care of this ambiguity. So there is a parametric uncertainty. If I maybe I could recognize that there is uh, this is a Brownian motion, but but uh, but I don't know the mu. Okay. How so, so? What's the impact of the uncertainty of the mu on this number? Okay, let, let me focus on this. And there are, you can add also, you know, extreme events, uh, the observation that in fact the bone in the bonal motion, it's 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 almost the, the probability of a big drop in GDP in the next century is, is almost zero, even with the large volatility to trend, it's it's amazing. But I will not, I have papers on considering other uh, parametric uncertainty than the one I'm considering as an illustration in this case. So I would like to convince you that taking into account of risks that are deeper than just assuming a Brownian motion is key to think about what this country should be used and more generally, what would be the optimal degree of long term risk. Long term, we should consider what we think about all those responsibilities we face uh, with respect to future generation, climate change, biodiversity, and also could be there and clear this. Okay, uh, 
So parametric uncertainty. I, let me, for a minute, let me get out of geometric bone and motion. Let me consider a very, very simple case where I assume that economic growth is an IID process. There is no CRI correlation in the growth rate. And on top of that, let me assume that the annual growth rate is either 0 person or 4 person with equal probability. And just to illustrate, to give you the flavor of what's the role of ambiguity on the measure of long term risk. Okay? So if you make this assumption that the annual growth rate is binary, has a binary distribution like that, and it's IID over time, over two periods, the growth rate, the, the risk you face from consumption in two years from now is the following. With probability one fourth, the growth rate will be zero person. With probability one fourth, the growth rate will be four person, person that is eight person. And with probability 0 0.5, uh, you will be lucky one year and then lucky the other year, you will, you will get four person. Okay. So that's what you get without ambiguity on the probability. Now, let me introduce parametric uncertainty. Let me assume that this probability, those probabilities are no. And let me take again the simplest version of that. Let me just assume that I don't know whether the probability of zero is either 0, 0 0.1, 10 person, or it's 90 person. And so I don't know what is this probability. So I remember, I, I assume an IID process, okay, with a binary distribution, zero, person or four person. But now let me assume that I don't know what's the probability of the zero person, what's the probability of the four person. And let me simply assume that this probability of zero person is either 10 person or 90 person. So I organize a mean finding spread in the probability. It's uh, introducing uh, uh, parametric uncertainty. So for a one year or for a one year horizon, this thing makes no change. You still have, by compounding probability, what's the probability of getting zero person in one year from now? It's 0 0.5 times 0 0.1 plus 0 0.5 times 0 0.9, that's 0 0.5. Okay, for a one year horizon, this parametric uncertainty has zero effect on your belief about the distribution of consumption this year. But when you go for two periods, and then you will go to, to you, you will do your send ex the expansion to 100 years. Uh, for two periods, when you do the, the tree, the probabilistic, the probabilistic tree, you get that the, con the consumption in two years from now will, of course, increase by 0 person, 4 person, or 8 person, but with probabilities in the tail of the distribution, which are much larger than those ones. Because of the parametric uncertainty, now this extreme event, I would say, have a much larger probability. You factor the tail to the parametric uncertainty. And so this is what, what I try to tell you here is that those, those deep uncertainty we face about how to calibrate the growth rate of the economy for such long time horizon imply that you, you don't really affect the, insert, the measure of the uncertainty and chance, but you magnify the long-term risk. And if you magnify the long-term risk, that justifies using, remember, a much smaller risk rate, precautionary effect, reduce the discount to the risk rate, and also magnify the risk premium. You are risk averse to larger risk by larger risk premium. So, so let me, let me, from this, this was just to give you a flavor of the importance of uh, parametric uncertainty, the way we calibrate long term risk. So here, another illustration of the same idea. Let me here assume that we have a geometric, geometric Boolean motion conditional to, uh, to mu, but I don't know mu. Mu is the trend. Huh? So geometric Boolean motion is indeed uh, an IIB process. Uh, condition to you, but now let me assume that I don't know you today. I don't know the trend for the next millennium. I know one thing. Let me just simplify one thing. I know one thing. It's either one person or three person. Really quite common. I will learn over time by, by observing whether next year uh, growth will be larger than expected or smaller than expected, and I will revise and be using Bayesian pool to my this, this belief. But at this stage today, this is my belief about the growth rate of consumption. 
Okay, so to re-illustrate what I did on previous slide, here is the density function for log of C1, log of C10, log of C100, and one of the log of C200 years. Okay, so for a 100, so the, uh, so the, the plane curve is for uh, the true distribution given the parametric uncertainty, and the dashed curve corresponds to the case where I assume the trend is two percent with product two. So for one year horizon, the difference is almost nothing. But for 200 years, that may just maybe be added this to that, you see that you flatten the tail, as I explained in the previous example. Okay, you not knowing whether the trend forever will be one person, three person, of course, that enormous that implies enormous increase in the risk with respect to the certainty of the trend of two person. And let you say about that and do some computation. It's obvious. But you see the illustration of that. It's, you know, you have, to, you have a, a distribution of log consumption to the years, which is much, much riskier than when you assume uh, the uncertainty just comes from the volatility of the Brownian motion. So what's the consequence of that? And that's the main, that's the main slide that we took. Uh, this is just an illustration of what could be done. I have been writing, I've written different papers exploring different illustration of parametric uncertainty. This is one, and keep in mind, Marty Weizmann did uh, something similar, uh, yeah, with the same idea, explained differently. But, uh, same idea. So here is the structure of this country for different projects with different beta, beta equal minus one, so projects that provide insurance, uh, beta equal zero risk-free project, beta equal one, the project was a degree of risk is similar to the growth rate of the aggregate consumption and so on. For time horizon from zero years to 150 years. I use the calibration, so I, what I do, I use the calibration delta equal zero, gamma equal two, and I assume the geometric Brownian motion with the unknown distribution, uh, uh, unknown trend, which is equal to either one person or three person, which is quite Okay, just to illustrate the, the, the intensity of the phenomenon. So you see for short time, for short horizon, you see two things. You see the equity premium puzzle and the risk rate puzzle. So you see the discount rate is almost always four person, whatever the four person is large. Okay, and that's the, we call that the equity premium, the risk rate puzzle with the utilitarian in without uncertainty or just a Brownian motion, as our presentation certainly imply very large risk compared to what we observe on the market over the last century. And we, we also, because the discount rate is very insensitive to the beta for short maturities, you see that means that the, the risk premium is very small. Okay, that's what's in the, in the slide on the consumption based capital situation model. But if you go to maturity of 150 years, you get very different numbers. First, you get a much smaller discount rate for history project. When beta equals zero, you see that you should use basically a zero risk-free rate to discount uh, risk-free risk -free cash flow. Okay, compared to the four person for short maturity, that the precautionary thing, because there is so much uncertainty about the future, if you get history project, for those maturity, you are happy to sacrifice a lot of your human consumption to provide this precaution, precaution saving from those human genetic children. But that's the first idea. And the second idea is because you magnify the long-term risk, you are strongly advised to provide insurance for those future generations living in that time horizon by, by selecting investment projects with large negative data. Because that are the project, that are the project that will generate a lot of additional consumption when it, when we learn that the mu is equal to one person rather than three person. Okay. And so you see when beta is minus one, an insurance project, you see, you should even use negative discount rate for even for projects with maturities it's around 40 years. So, Yes, in the beginning, when it's, when it's zero, it's, it's driven by the mean growth rate, that's the question. The mean, yeah, exactly. Which the end is driven by the minimum growth rate, whatever that was in your experience. 
Yeah, yeah, that's why it's been driven. So for the risk, for the risk, we have to take care of the bigger yeah. so You have two growth rates, two possibilities. Yeah. So, so the bigger one just doesn't play a role in it. Exactly. exactly. So that's, yeah. Then, then, so then, he, then explain why the church structure goes you know, and stays horizontal could be this one. Um, so I understand it, it's down the church structure, uh, like a white and stuff out. But explain uh, why it goes up could be this muscle, but we need one. one. When, when beta is larger than one, you have an increase in consumption for the risk adjusted discount. Yeah. That's okay. because the risk effect, the, the willingness to to penalize those projects that increase the microcolities at the time, you already have a lot of microcolities. You, you dislike it so much that you, you want to use a very large risk contract for those risk increasing functions. Uh, okay. So you see, for, for time horizon related to this to climate change, remember the, the half life of CO2 you need today in the atmosphere is larger than 100 years. So the, when you think about, when you look at the site, the, the social cost of carbon is, I mean, what happens to your economy uh, beyond 100, 100 years, it's important in the way you value the, the social cost of carbon. Uh, so, so for those five horizons, you see, I should use something like a discount rate around between zero and one person and the risk premium which is something like two three percent okay. so now if i want to that's just illustrative okay i don't i don't try to tell you this is the number this are the number. by the way these are the number i, I convinced the federal government to revise this is in france we are using it an official discount rate, the official discount rate system since 2011 uh, is associated to this kind of competition. I will, I will not try to go into detail anyway. We do not, not live in France, so that's not even in the, in the UK, I tried to convince the, the National Treasury to, um, to use that kind of thing. Uh, they indeed they use a decrease in term structure. They start at 3.5% for short maturity, they go down to 2.5% for maturity beyond 75 years, but they don't adjust the discount rate for the distinctness of this contract in the consideration. They find it, I don't know why, probably estimating an income is the complex number. Where are where are your students? <laughs> uh, okay, so now the remaining question, if I, if you give me another five minutes. Yeah, five minutes and let's leave a little bit of time for okay. questions. Okay. So then, then if I, if I suppose I, I'm ready to use those numbers, the risk rate of one person, the risk premium of two person, remember, then I have to estimate uh, the, uh, the, 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 the risk adjusted discount rate would be I can do it. Yeah. Something like that. Okay. So then, if I want to do that for estimating the percent cost of carbon, I need to estimate the. And that's why I am not much to uh, Maybe like uh, my discussion with that, because he's also looking at this. What's the better of climate change? Do you think? That investing in reducing emissions of CO2 today reduce the risk borne by future generations, or does it increase it? But first, let me mention two. Let me mention that fighting climate change has an uncertain benefit. We know that reducing emissions will reduce the climate climate impact, climate climate, but we don't know much about that. By how much reducing emissions of CO2 today, by how much it will reduce the emission in the future. We, 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 we don't know for at least two reasons. So there, there are at least two sources of big, deep uncertainty. First, climatologists are not, there is no consensus about 
le, le gamme de sensitivité paramétrique. Le gamme de sensitivité paramétrique est par le nombre de temps que tu augmentes la température de cette planète, quand tu doubles la concentration de CO2 dans l'atmosphère comparé à la pluie et à la pluie. Cette figure give you different density functions estimated by different uh, climatologists of this climate sensitivity parameter on the vertical, on the horizontal axis you have degrees Celsius increase in, in temperature compared to previous age from one degree, two, three, four, five, six, five, ten degrees Celsius. And so that are the density functions from different studies. And you see, first, each density function has uh, some standard deviation, so it should be drop of line and we don't know, but also different studies provide different density functions. We have an ambiguity of the probability distribution. That's an additional layer of complexity, and we not talk about ambiguity of version here. We could talk about that, but uh, I don't have time to do that. Uh, second thing is, uh, one support that we know the increased temperature, Economists and social scientists and biologists did agree on the consequence of this increased temperature on damage. Now, you much, what will be if you increase temperature by two degrees Celsius? What will be the reduction in the worldwide GDP? And here, just as an illustration from my colleague Thomas Turner from Cotterbury University, I have different damage functions that we call them. So damage function link the increased temperature to the reduction of GDP per capita. So you see there is a lot of uncertainty, in particular for large temperature. But I really this is very illustrative. I mean, I say that there is more uncertainty than just the one represented here by different expert uh, evaluation of the damage function. Because mostly each of these damage functions are coming from and uh, so big uncertainty. So, 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 so investing in reducing CO2 emission uh, generate uncertain benefit. So, probably there is a bit. So what's the what's the sign of the bit? I'm just trying to estimate this. But let me, think, let me try to think about what's the sign of the climate data. The problem is, I'm trying to this uh, idea of positive discount rate from mini quality version. I don't have a theory, a general theory of uh, that gives you uh, an ambiguous sign for the beta, for the climate beta. Why? Because I have two stories, and each of these two stories provides opposite results. I have a negative beta story, which is probably the one you have in mind. Okay, if you assume that the the, the, the uncertainty bound by future generation is mostly due to climate change. Of course, if you get to learn uh, that the climate sensitivity is larger than expected, at the same time, consumption will, be, will drop because damage will be larger. And, and reducing emission today will provide more benefits because then damage will be smaller because the concentration of CO2 will be smaller. So you see there is a negative correlation in that case. No, sorry. Uh, well, yes, a negative condition between the benefit of fighting climate change today and future consumption. Okay, so in this case, you have indeed and, uh, fighting climate change today provide an insurance to uh, to future generation, not only reducing emission, reduce the expected damages, but also it reduces more the expected damages when in the worst of nature it provides insurance. The problem is most, if not all, climate models, integrated assessment models that we use in economics, assume that climate damage is proportional to weight. And okay, makes sense. You know, you know real estate, uh, if you have more weight on real estate, then you get uh, tsunami and things like that, there will be more damage. Okay, so most like the DICE model probably assume that climate damage is proportional to wealth. And uh, proportional climate damage means the income elasticity is equal to one. So, so you, you don't know what's the mediating story, so you need to go to calibration. And so that's what I did with the two colleagues 
uh, Simon Dietz and Luis Tesler from Grand Tavern Institute uh, five or six years ago, and more recently I'm working with, uh, with um, Derek uh, Lemoyne. So let me just look at what I did from, so if you use dice, you get something like that here, just a, a lot of consumption, no, consumption is 50 years from now, uh, marginal damage is 50 years from now, you see yeah, it's a positive combination, uh, and, uh, and, the, and when you estimate the, the elasticity, you get 0 0.7, so you should use in this formula, beta equals 0 0.7. But if I refer to that's what we get with some bits and kind of and, and, and bit space. Now, if you use an alternative model, per uh, cell, uh, cell of and others, uh, an alternative uh, integrated assessment model, you do the same exercise, Monte Carlo, you calibrate uh, the different source of uncertainty. There is the log of consumption in 50 years from now, and here is the log of marginal damage in 50 years from now. Boom. You get a negative number. Here it's seen that the negative story, the negative beta story dominate, you get beta equals something, but, but minus 3.5. You get uh, beta again, so three, minus 3.5, you do the math and you get a uh, big bad number. Okay, let me stop here just to tell you, you know, we still, uh, I'm sorry, I'm not able to conclude about what, it, what sort of cost of carbon we should use because we are far from a clear. The presentation of what's the profile of this that is able to find climate change. And we can, although I think uh, we made progress in the way we think about discounting, in the way we should recognize our responsibility to our future generation, into uh, the operational process of determining what action should be performed today, we still. In relation to climate change, we still face a lot of research to be performed to estimate the risk profile, to measure this formula, to estimate this formula, and therefore to go to to go back to uh, to be integrated sensible model and to, to to do the math for uh, estimating at this discount take the flow of the discounted flow of expected marginal damage. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>